We just put out a video on that near midair with that B-52 bomber out in North Dakota. You've got questions, we've got answers. It's time for Ask the Captain. All right, question number one. Got to put the old spectacles on for this. Chun One U20. What is going on in the aviation industry this year? It feels like these incidents are happening more frequently. You're not wrong about that. Uh, it feels like that to me as well. Uh, the past eight months have been kind of unprecedented. Now, in the sense that things happen all the time, but they don't always get reported. I think it's because there's been a couple of major crashes this year that all of a sudden there's heightened awareness in the news cycle about any minor incursion with an airplane. Certainly we've been trying to cover most of them here on the channel, mostly to be informative, educational, and kind of help the passenger. If I'm a passenger, I want to know what's going on. So that's a great question. I, you know, I think uh, it's going to calm down going forward. If you think about the last 15 years, there's been virtually no major airline accidents in the last 15 years. It has been in the last eight months, but I'm hoping as well as you do that this, uh, is in our rearview mirror pretty fast. Good question. All right. Uh, how Brad 4601, can you discuss the potential ground risk when a near miss happens over a populated area? Well, if it's a near miss, there's no, <laughs> there's no uh, ground hazard at all. If there is a midair collision, I, I think your odds of getting struck by lightning are probably a little bit higher than that because midair collisions are so rare. We saw one earlier this year, but I haven't heard of one in probably 30 years or more. Uh, and then if you're on the ground and you get hit with a piece of debris from one of those, then uh, you're having a bad day. It's, that's I think you're more likely to get hit by lightning with that. But a near miss, there's no, um, there's no for worry at all. Okay, next question is a logic theorist. Uh, I heard a different version from the military. The B-52 was where it was supposed to be and the regional pilot overreacted. How do investigators sort out two completely different sides of the story like this? Well, you know, you kind of expect both parties to have a little different version of what they think happened. Everybody's going to defend themselves and say they were where they were supposed to be. What took place here is highly subjective, all right? If one pilot looks and sees and thinks that they're just too close, they're going to do whatever they think they need to do to turn a threat into something that's safe. So feeling threatened looks a little different to everybody else. I am here to tell you a B-52 in your windscreen is a very large airplane. If you're in a regional jet, you know what? I'm okay if the pilot overreacts. I don't want him to underreact in a situation like that. But yep, there's always two sides to a story. Great question. Okay, next is... Uh, you see, ATC Legend 8807, an air traffic controller mentioned that all military planes have transponders, but not all have ADSB. Can you explain the difference and why that's so important for collision avoidance? Yeah, that is true. Uh, every airplane has a transponder, which is just a four digit code that they put in that identifies the airplane, uh, the altitude that they're at uh, to air traffic control. It doesn't always transmit that information to other aircraft, ADSB does. And that's where the traffic collision avoidance system between airplanes comes into play. So ADSB has to be working for that system to work properly. Remember the B-52 is older than I am. I think it's 70 plus years old, this airplane. Uh, not all of them have the, the newest uh, equipment in them and not that they need to because of the mission that they fly, but that's what ADSB does. It works at TCAS, it lets other airplanes know where you are. Um, Transponder just lets ATC know you are. They will communicate with the other aircraft, right? Makes sense. Oh, so the next question is Fat Rats 2012. Why don't military aircraft have TCAS? Uh, like commercial planes do? Well, the answer to that is some military aircraft do have TCAS and some don't. My understanding with this particular B-52 is that they had it, but it wasn't turned on. Now, for whatever reason, I, I don't know the answer to why it wasn't turned on. Uh, in a mission like this, they probably don't need it. You're talking on the radios, you're clearing yourself from other aircraft. Uh, that's probably enough. Uh, I remember, they're, they're followed by ATC into an uncontrolled uh, airport. Air traffic control is still tracking them for most of the flight. Uh, would it have been helpful to have TCAS? I don't think TCAS gives you uh, climb or descend commands below a thousand feet. And I'm guessing that most of their work here was going to be below a thousand feet. That might have been why they turned it off 
I, I don't know, but that, that's a great question. Okay, uh, we've got uh, Cedric uh, Wester, 8607. Did the TCAS on the commercial airliner activate to give a warning during this incident? I don't know, but I don't think so. And I think it depends on whether the TCAS on the other aircraft is on or not. And uh, our understanding is it was turned off. So if it's turned off over on the other aircraft, then the two signals don't meet to give the airliner the instructions that it would need. So again, that's why pilots are trained to keep their head on a swivel. And when you're at an uncontrolled airfield, you're extra vigilant to be looking out the window to make sure that there's no traffic, even though you made a radio call and said, hey, here's where I am. And is there anybody else around? And nobody else answered. It may have been that two airplanes made the same transmission at the same time and simply didn't hear each other. But heads up to those pilots. They did a great job. Okay, here we go. Uh, I've got Scott 3744. A transponder on a military aircraft seems like a contradiction in purpose, All right? Does training uh, to always broadcast your presence become a bad habit that could compromise a mission? No, it's never a bad habit to communicate. Uh, it's always a good habit. Now, maybe you're talking about like doing secret military missions and you're trained not to communicate on those. That's a completely different ball of yarn than this is. They're obviously going into a civilian airport in the USA, probably on a mission to get landings, do touch and goes. They're going to communicate. Every pilot is trained in aviate, uh, navigate, communicate. They're going to do that thoroughly and effectively. Um, something went wrong in this one, but again, it got caught at the last minute by the pilots on the Delta flight. Good on them. All right, uh, fast fat man. Uh, the B-52 has a radar cross section the size of a third world country. That is true. All right. Uh, shouldn't it have been picked up on primary radar, even if its transponder was off? Well, that would assume that there's some air traffic control facility that's watching it. And they did. They're being tracked by air traffic control all the way into the uncontrolled airport. Once they get into the the bounce pattern or the traffic pattern at the uncontrolled airport, they're now talking to other airplanes directly, clearing themselves from those other airplanes. Remember, there's nobody in the tower that's looking at a radar screen at this point. There's, it's an unmanned tower, and the common traffic advisory frequency is the frequency that everybody that's operating at that airport would be talking on to clear themselves. All right, uh, we got uh, Image uh, Byrick. All right, I've heard Minot. Uh, International Airport ATC doesn't have radar and operates visually. Uh, how does a non-radar environment impact safety with mixed military and civilian aircraft? Well, I think you're seeing a good example of it here. Uh, do I wish that every airport had a control tower with radar? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are some where they're just remote enough that they can't afford it or they can't staff it for 24 hours a day. Uh, you've heard about air traffic controllers and how they're understaffed. Well, it's showing up in places like Minot. And so if there was you know, more air traffic controllers trained, uh, maybe if they'd raise the retirement age, same thing with pilots. If they'd raise the retirement age, there'd be more pilots available to continue to fly. But again, Congress could act. And uh, I'll leave it at that. The next question is from uh, uh, Thash Roko. Wait, <laughs> so the military base has its own air traffic controllers and they don't communicate with commercial ATCs? How does that system work? Well, military bases do have their own air traffic controllers. They do communicate with the civilian counterparts. So, for instance, I flew many years out of Brunswick Naval Air Station up in Brunswick, Maine. It's now been closed, but it was a military base. They would have Navy personnel manning the tower locally at the base. And then when I would depart and I would climb out, I would be handed over to Portland Center or I handed off to Portland departure. I would then be talking to a civilian, not a military. When I got handed back off from Portland, the civilian controller back to the military, I would talk to a enlisted man or woman in the tower uh, at that time. So that's how the military bases work. So it's not that they don't talk to each other. They actually complicate, complement each other, not complicate, but complement each other um, very well. Okay, uh, Studio 23 Media. Should military planes be required to operate on civilian frequencies when they are near uh, civilian airfields in peacetime, or do they have their own separate system? Yeah, this is an issue still to this day. Uh, when I was flying military aircraft, there was 
VHF radios and there was UHF radios. And the military primarily spoke on v UHF radios. And the UHF radios are just a different frequency band that other military aircraft can talk to one another on. We did have a VHF radio, which all the civilian commercial airliners talk on. And when we would be flying the commercial airways, we would be speaking on that VHF radio. It should be required that anytime you're at a civilian airport, you're on that frequency. I don't know that that was the problem here. I don't think they were on two different frequencies because in order to come into an uncontrolled feel like that, they're going to have to look up that, that CTF AF frequency and all be on that same VHF frequency. I'm assuming they were not sure why the two didn't recognize each other, but at the last minute, the Delta pilot saw them and took evasive actions. All right, we've got uh, crypto shaped. When a B-52 is on a special mission, I assume they fly without a transponder. If so, shouldn't a notum notice to uh, air missions, notice to airmen be issued to alert civil traffic uh, or to, to alert civilian traffic? Again, if they're on a special or a secret mission, you're not going to do a notum to alert people to that secret mission. It's kind of defeating the purpose. I'm not really sure how to handle this question. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next is uh, a bunch of letters and a bunch of numbers. Here we go. What are the current rules for military operations near civilian airports? And should new rules be put in place to create more separation? I don't know that you need more separation, but I would like to see everybody on one frequency band. If it's VHF, everybody's got to be on VHF. If it's UHF, everybody's got to be on UHF. But every aircraft in the U US of A should uh, be required to have both VHF and UHF communications and be told which one frequency the other airplane is talking on or one common frequency. That just makes sense. All right, I've got uh, Car Carmen. Eberano 9765, is a shortage of air traffic controllers a factor in these recent incidents? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Um, if Minot is equipped to have an air traffic controller or some people manning the tower and they were just short-staffed or understaffed or couldn't be there at the hours that they should have been when other aircraft are coming in, yeah, they, they, they need to be that. Now, how does that work out? Well, it takes a long time to, to train an air traffic controller. They time out at age 56. That just seems really young to me, but you know, it's again, it's the law. So things can change to help this. We can train more air traffic controllers and we're kind of at that now trying to do that, but it doesn't happen overnight. So is it all right to go into a uncontrolled airfield? Is it still safe? Yes, it's absolutely safe to do that. Would it be more safe if there was somebody in the control tower watching? Yeah, absolutely. Bits of geek. When a pilot is explaining something like this, in such detail to passengers, are they effectively venting because they can't do it on the radio? Well, I did listen to the captain talk to the passengers in the back. Did the captain share maybe a little bit too much? That's It's up to you. I, I, I like when captains communicate. Was this guy kind of frustrated? Yeah, you can hear it in his voice. He, does he need somebody to talk to? Yeah, probably his co-pilot would have been the better person for some of the details. But at the same time, I think honesty is always the best policy. I think you need to be frank with your passengers and say, hey, look, this is unusual. This doesn't normally happen. So sorry about the upset in the back of the airplane, but here's what happened and here's why it happened. And you saw everybody applauded for him at the end. So they were satisfied with that answer, mostly because they got communicated to. Many captains just don't communicate at all, which I think is a shame. Final question. The Banjo Show official. What is the actual process of accountability after a near miss like this for the controllers and the pilots of the bomber? Well, there'll, there'll be an investigation that looks into this. The FAA will investigate it. This is not an NTSB investigation because there was no accident, but the FAA will investigate it. They'll look into it. They might make a few phone calls, talk to a couple people and say, all right, well, we've learned our lesson, nothing here, and just close the books on it. It may go farther than that. They may want to put new procedures in place, and they may want to, you know, give a letter of violation to somebody that wasn't doing it right. Uh, I, I know that that's happened as well. So there's various levels that the FAA will come into, but at a minimum, uh, they're going to talk to the military and the civilian side about their training and how we can avoid this sort of thing 
in the future. That's their job and they're pretty good at it. They actually follow up on these things. You'd be surprised. All right, great questions today. Uh, keep the comments coming because if you get the right comment at the right time, you might end up on the next episode of Ask the Captain.